Thank you for the opportunity to testify in favor of AB 465, the Help Not Harm Act. This is a health issue that impacts the lives of real people who struggle with gender dysphoria. And we need to make sure that we help and not harm those individuals by prohibiting irreversible and harmful medical gender transition for minors. I expect today that you will hear from some that this bill flies in the face of accepted medical practice. People will say that the American Medical Association and other groups all consider medical gender transition to be standard care. People will reference generically that there are many studies that support this. I encourage you today to ask them what studies. I've asked a major medical institution in Wisconsin to do just that, send me the best studies that justify medical gender transition. I have received only three. And each of them had a small number of participants and tracked them no further than two years after gender transition. This is insufficient scientific evidence. On the other hand, you have the United States Medicare and Medicaid services that did a meta-analysis of 33 different peer-reviewed studies. In August 2016, they stated that, quote, the majority of studies were non-longitudinal, exploratory-type studies, or did not include concurrent controls or testing prior to and after surgery. After careful assessment, this continues the quote, we identified six studies that could provide useful information. Of these, the four best designed and conducted studies that assessed quality of life before and after surgery using validated, albeit nonspecific, psychometric studies did not demonstrate clinically significant changes or differences in psychometric, psychometric test results after GRS. GRS means gender reassignment surgery. This was a meta-analysis done under the Obama administration, and they concluded that the best evidence did not show positive changes to support gender transition. The same was decided by researchers in numerous other countries, including Sweden, Finland, England, Denmark, Norway, Australia, and New Zealand. Dr. Rob Garofalo, the director of Lurie Children's Hospital's Gender and Sex Development Program in Chicago, said, there are so many unanswered questions around the long-term consequences and can only be answered with long-term follow-up studies. The stakes, he says, are super high and we don't have all the answers. If we don't have all the answers, why are we allowing doctors to experiment on minors when we know that there are long-term consequences, such as bone density loss, sterilization, and heart problems? It is a complete lie to say that this help not harm bill flies in the face of medical science. You will find with my testimony the written testimony of other medical experts and fact sheets with extensive footnotes that direct you to a multitude of studies, peer-reviewed scientific journals. If people say that the science shows that medical gender transition helps minors, ask them for peer-reviewed, long-term clinical evidence. You won't find any. You might also hear today that this bill is anti-trans that this is an attack on trans identity and a threat to their very existence. That is simply not true. This bill does not remove any adult's choice to medically transition their gender, nor does it remove a minor's choice to socially transition. In a democracy, we respect the choices of others. And we also recognize that some choices have such long-lasting effects that those choices should only belong to adults. As a state, we restrict the decision-making of minors when we see the risk of significant harm. 
We do not allow minors to drink alcohol, smoke, get married, sign contract, and the list goes on. We do this because we've always known that minors can make emotional, impulsive decisions. Now, with the development of brain science, we know why. The prefrontal cortex is not fully developed until the age of 25, and it is this part of the brain that is responsible for long-term logical decision-making. Youth operate more from the emotional part of the brain. Youth are more prone to peer pressure and social pressure, and this is something that Dr. Erica Anderson, a trans woman, Dr. Erica Anderson, a trans woman, and a former president of the U.S. Professional Association of Transgender Health is particularly concerned about. She wrote in an article, and I quote, In my over 40 years as a psychologist, I have seen psychotherapeutic phenomenon come and go, eating disorders, multiple personality disorders, repressed memory syndrome, have in retrospect, in retrospect spread through subgroups of adolescents and the professionals who have treated them. This spread is like wildfire through vulnerable underbrush, clearly born in an environment of contagion. How is it possible that gender identity formation constitutes the only area of development in adolescence that is immune from peer influence? End quote. Opponents of this bill want to say that beginning medical transition creates the pause needed for young people to decide. However, puberty suppressants and cross-sex hormones do irreversible damage. The Help Not Harm bill is actually the bill that would create the space and time for minors to consider the long-term consequences of gender transition and make an appropriate choice for them when they become a legal adult. Now, you may also hear people say that this bill will lead to more kids committing suicide. It is certainly true that young people, as a general age category, struggle more with suicide. And it is also true that those who are struggling with gender dysphoria are even more likely to commit suicide. That is why we need... We, let's try that again. That is why they need help and not permanent harm. So a good question is what will lower the suicide rate? Everyone should care about answering this question and answering it well. The Swedish long-term study showed that even after gender transition, that individuals were still 19 times more likely to commit suicide than the population average. The leading cause of death, in fact, for participants after medical gender transition was suicide. This suggests that the problem of suicide does not go away after medical transition. In fact, there are no long-term clinical studies that show evidence of lowering suicide. What does help is talk therapy that helps address other comorbidities often at play in those who struggle with gender dysphoria. Dr. Kenneth Zucker, who worked for 30 years at the University of Toronto in the field of gender identity, he... Okay. Sorry to interrupt. Representative Allen, but there cannot be any cheering, snickering, or comments on the side. I want to have a respectful hearing, respectful conversation, and listen to all the opinions today. So if you can't... If you can't control yourself, I'm going to ask you to either step outside or the sergeant's office and Capitol Police will have you removed. So with that, please be respectful of everyone else in here, whether they agree with you or not. And with that, Representative Allen, the floor is yours. Again, Dr. Zucker, who worked in the field of gender identity for 30 years, determined that the best practice for minors with gender dysphoria was talk therapy to work through family dynamics, trauma, and other mental health issues. When doing this, he found 
that the gender dysphoria usually resolved itself without any harmful medical transitioning. This is confirmed by other research and the DSM-5, the major psychological manual which recognizes that the vast majority of minors will outgrow gender dysphoria if not pushed to transition. The options are not simply transition or suicide. You may also hear a lot of stories today, perhaps stories of those who have transitioned and are thankful for it. But we will also hear stories of those who had to detransition, stories like Billy Burley and Luke Hine that will be included in a written testimony. I want to stress again that this bill does not take away the choice of a legal adult to medically transition. This bill will protect minors from being rushed into a change that they might later regret and yet cannot recover from. Unfortunately, gender transition for minors is a cash cow for pharmaceutical companies, hospitals, and medical centers. According to a recent PBS report, the cost of puberty blockers is about $1,200 a month. Cross-sex hormones are less expensive at, a, at an, about an average of $102 per month, but they must, they must be taken for life, as in forever. Imagine making a decision for your 14-year-old that would give them a financial burden like that forever. Drugs that once had no market suddenly have a long life and growing market. Then there's the money made off of the surgeries. When the hospitals come to speak and, and, and speak to you about caring for minors, ask them how many kids they are helping and ask them about how much they charge for a visit for those medications and those surgeries. Ask the hospitals if they're doing any long-term follow-up to ensure that their patients are truly being helped. In conclusion, if the medical science shows us that medical gender transition does not help, does not reduce the risk of suicide, causes irreversible harm, and is experimental at best, who is really helping our kids? Thank you.